from KSAT 12. The night beat starts right now. It was the key to the crime. The key to one home unlocked the door to a neighbor's. That's how Bear County deputies say a man who was believed to be intoxicated was able to mistakenly enter the wrong house. The investigators say that he attacked the homeowner, but as the night team's John Paul Barajas explains, there are questions about why the suspect's key opened the wrong door in the first place. It's very strange that someone can enter a house that they have no connection to with the key of their actual home, said one neighbor. Those we spoke to in the meadows at were the Mokes neighborhood say they have questions. Now that deputies say one of their neighbors was attacked by another neighbor who was able to enter the wrong house using his own key. That's one that boggles my mind for sure. Is like, especially having two homes, same looking. It's unfortunate for the neighbors. Eric Coyasso is charged with injury to an elderly person. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says Coyasso thought he was in his own home and attacked the 79-year-old homeowner. According to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, the suspect's keys to his home unlocked the victim's front door. Investigators say they checked the keys to verify that, and that was in fact the case. We're not sure how that is, but believe it could be an issue with the builder of the homes. The suspect declined an interview, but his parents told me off camera his home was built by MI Homes. So we asked MI about the keys working for two separate homes. The person who answered my call said they would look into it and get back to us. Does it make you think twice about your locks? Yeah, absolutely. Now it makes me think like we have different build or this builder that we're, we have. Wanna make, makes me want to call them. As of right now, I have not heard back from MI Homes. However, I did get an update on the homeowner from BCSO tonight. They tell us he is at home and recovering from several injuries, including three fractured ribs. All right, if I'm living in that neighborhood right now, I'm wondering, are there other keys out there that fit my home that belong to a neighbor? I mean, how widespread is this problem? That's definitely the big question, and we're hoping to get those answers from MI. The other thing to take into account here is we spoke to several people off camera in that neighborhood, and they had no idea that this had even happened. So definitely a lot of shock and uh, concern. Probably them trying to figure out what to do even tonight. Absolutely. I'd be calling the locksmith in the morning, that's for sure. Thank Probably you, John a good Paul. Idea. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, more than three years after Jacob Dubois was murdered, a jury has found his killer, this man, guilty. On Monday, a Guadalupe County jury found 23-year-old Ethan Beckman guilty of murder and tampering with evidence. Prosecutors there say the victim, Jacob, disappeared in March of 2021. Shirts police say the discovery of Jacob's remains in September of 2022 led to Beckman's indictment in March of last year. Chief Jim Lowry says he hopes Beckman's conviction will give Jacob's family some peace. The FBI was busy raiding two homes in the same side of town this morning. One raid happened at a place on Hunter's Raven and the other was at a home near Bandera and 1604. Both of those on the northwest side just before 6 a.m. An FBI official tells KSAT that agents were carrying out court orders. Now, at this point, we don't know who was charged or what they were charged with, but people who live in the area near both of those homes say that the operation was so loud, they can hear it, they can feel it inside their homes. All I heard was um, the, the FBI saying, FBI search warrant, um, come out with your hands up. The bangs were so loud that I felt the vibration coming through my, my house. Now, the FBI also raided a home on Hackberry Street today, and in that case, we don't have information on the charges or suspects either. Clouds are slowly filling in. We're waiting on showers on the radar. Right now, we're looking off to the west, and we'll be watching closer to the Rio Grande within the coming hours. Rain is likely to develop. Expect a damp commute. We'll time out the rain for you when the sun returns and how much rain we should get in just a bit. Speaking of timing things out, I know you're also timing out that solar eclipse. Now that we're less than two weeks away, our KSAT weather team wants to make sure that you're ready. So tomorrow, our meteorologist Sarah Spivey and Mia Montgomery are going to host an eclipse glasses giveaway at Yanaguana Garden at Hemisphere. Yeah, you can start lining up at 4 p.m. The glasses will be handed out at 6.30. You can find more information on this giveaway right now on KSAT.com. Calabra Road getting a makeover. For years, we've told you about all the issues on that busy street. Well, tonight, the city of San Antonio showed people in the area the first phase of the construction project. The night team's Patty Santos shows us how the city is hoping that this will improve safety.
This is a, a pretty wide street and um, you know there's a lot of pedestrian and uh, we're including those, those street trees as well. To part of Calabra Road are expected to start in 2025, but Assistant City Engineer David McBath says upgrades have been in the city's radar for years. Talk to me about Culebra Road. This has been a it's a road that we always visit. There's always issues. There are a lot of issues and that there's a, a pretty significant crash history out here up and down the entire corridor. He says construction will narrow all lanes along Culebra between Bandera Road and General McMullen Drive. So you'd still keep the five lanes of traffic. The north side of the road will have a wider shared sidewalk. Total reconstruction of the street. It's not in great condition right now, but also uh, we'll do some upgraded underground storm drainage improvements. I'm like 500 square feet away from Calabria Road. Eva Martinez says speeding is a big problem. I have heard actual car accidents. The city says narrowing those lanes will force drivers to slow down while making more room for pedestrians. Macbeth says construction will likely start next year. Before we go to construction, we'll come back to the community and uh, tell them who our contractor is, what um, the timing and the schedule looks like, and how we're going to phase some of the work so they'll know when their property is being impacted. The $18 million project was approved by voters in 2022. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. It, to many, it signifies a new beginning. Construction to lay the foundation of the new Uvalde Elementary School underway. And today, the group raising money for the building actually received a $1 million gift to help in its goal of raising $60 million. At this point, there's still $20 million to be raised. The Uvalde CISD Moving Forward Foundation broke ground on the project in October, but delayed construction to reopen the bidding process to find a lower bid. Well, now construction company Satterfield and Ponticus is taking over the job. The delay will ultimately impact the projected completion date for the project as a whole. Our target date for substantial completion is September of 2025. Um, and then after we get the sign off to get into the building, we'll need to put the desks and the other furniture fixer equipment. And from there, the district will make the decisions on when the school's ready for students and teachers. As for the demolition of Rob Elementary, that's at the discretion of the Valley School District officials there waiting on clearance from the district attorney before they can move forward. At this point, we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. It's the last thing that you wanted to hear from Baltimore. A tragic update there after that bridge collapse. Rescue efforts to find the six people over tonight. Now the U.S. Coast Guard is focused on recovering their bodies. Now you've probably seen video of that cargo ship right there slamming into the Francis Scott Key Bridge this morning, and the video is just shocking to look at. Yeah, I cannot imagine being on that bridge. Mm. Truly heartbreaking, knowing there were people there. Apparently, construction workers filling potholes when it came crashing in the Patapsco River. All six people who are missing are believed to be dead tonight. The ship in a tangled mess of remains of the bridge in the river. It has not moved. Investigators believe the cargo ship lost power just before it collided with the support beam. Yeah, the bridge came down in just a matter of seconds. I mean, you saw it a moment ago. There were no drivers on the bridge at the time, but we did tell you there were people on there because construction crews uh, there with their vehicles, they were on that bridge. The pilots on the ship reportedly warned the Maryland Transportation Department that the vessel could crash right before it made impact. Maryland officials say that warning call prompted the bridge to shut down to traffic and that potentially saved a lot of lives in this disaster. The recovery efforts are set to pick back up early tomorrow morning. We also want to mention there has been no credible evidence that suggests this accident was an act of terror. In other news now, prosecutors have announced a deal with Attorney General Ken Paxton to drop securities fraud charges that were pending against him for nearly a decade. So now prosecutors are saying they're going to dismiss three felony counts against Paxton if he completes the terms of the deal. Now that deal would include paying nearly $300,000 in restitution, completing 100 hours of community service, and taking 15 hours of legal ethics education. Here's the thing, if he had been convicted, Paxton could have been sentenced to life in prison. 
This is Holy Week leading up to Easter Sunday, and this year the Archdiocese of San Antonio will celebrate 150 years. It's a long time, and so uh, we're really excited, and this is bringing a new life to all of us and to the whole church. Yeah. All of the priests of the Archdiocese gathering today at Holy Spirit Church on Blanco Road to celebrate the establishment of the Archdiocese in August of 1874. The priests also renewing their promises during a special mass this evening. Just one of many events planned for the entire year to celebrate the 150th anniversary. Okay, speaking of this, we're three days from Good Friday, and with that Holy Day comes a San Antonio tradition, which is the annual Passion of the Christ play. Parishioners from San Fernando Cathedral are going to reenact the Passion starting at Travis Park. That's going to be Friday morning at 10, and it's going to end also on the steps of San Fernando Cathedral with the portrayal of the crucifixion. Now, if you can't go, we're going to stream the entire Passion play on our website, ksat.com. Another San Antonio staple celebrating an anniversary. We just told you about the Archdiocese. Well, the Tobin Center has accomplished so much in its first 10 years and what they plan to do over the next decade. I think it's one of the city's best buildings, blending the old and the new. One of the city's biggest cultural institutions is having a birthday, turning 10 years old. The Tobin Center celebrating a decade of calling downtown San Antonio a home. In those 10 years, President and CEO Michael Fresher says they've hosted 2.8 million people for more than 4,500 events, bringing in $200 million of economic impact. As for the next 10 years, the focus on future generations. The Tobin Center's educational program, serving students and teachers in more than 20 South Central Texas school districts. Okay, wanna ask you something. Do you remember this? Yeah, the statue of an American Indian that used to stand outside the Red Macomb Superior Hyundai dealership for years. Yeah, it was controversial back then, and now that it has a new home, it still is. So yesterday, that statue went up at the Jordanton High School football stadium. It was removed from the dealership, you remember this, along Loop 410 about eight months ago. The Jordanton ISD wouldn't speak with us about the statue, but did release a statement saying that it is committed to making sure that that statue remains an integral part of its community for generations. Some people are happy about it, others not so much. But it goes to show you that it's the mindset that you know, all Indians are the same. And so we can get away with it. It's quite a big figure, and I think it's going to help the help the guys, help the fans, you know, kind of give them something to look to. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it'll be good, you know, a little motivation. So it's unclear why that statue went to that specific location. We tried asking the school district and McCombs Enterprises, but we didn't get an answer for that. But we do have an answer for this. The Mega Millions jackpot now $1.3 billion. The numbers got drawn just a little while ago. So here they are. 11, 22, 7, 29, 38. Mega Balls 4. Multiplier is 2. Good luck to you. Happening tomorrow, our KSAT community partners hosting a town hall to share information on organ donations. We'll also discuss the challenges and misconceptions of being a live organ donor. The town hall starts tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Yeah, let's get you ready for tomorrow now let's, uh, and that morning commute. Yes, damp morning commute. Mm. Have an umbrella ready to go at the bus stop and be prepared to uh, have the windshield wipers and headlights on for the entire commute with a little bit of road spray and damp roads. Heavy rainfall? No, mainly light in nature and not adding up to a whole lot. We're not talking anything drought denting, but we'll take every drop that we can get right now. Take a look at our chances through the night and early morning. The rain chances ramp up a little bit and they peak during the morning commute at 40%. So scattered in nature. And I do think most of, if not all of Bear County, will get hit by some light rain at some point. Notice how those rain chances fall off. One o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, 0%. That's because we'll actually clear out and have some sunshine for the second half of the day. Here's the big picture. And we have a lot of moisture on the East Coast, stretching all the way up into New England and the Great Lakes. Snow on the back side of this system, on the cold side. and. Notice how this activity scattered around the Rocky Mountains 
higher elevation snow, lower elevation rain, and especially New Mexico into West Texas. That's our next little burst of energy. We talked about this little burst of energy yesterday, and now it's looking like it will develop some areas of light to even a few moderate showers early tomorrow morning. But it starts late tonight, closer to the Rio Grande and into the hill country. Then as we get into the pre dawn hours, starting to creep near San Antonio and through the morning commute, some areas of light and at times maybe a few moderate showers that'll last until the noon hour. Then we clear out and we have a lot of sunshine and a nice and pleasant afternoon. As for overall rainfall potential, most of us under a tenth of an inch. So not exactly drought denting or something that's going to make a big difference. Well, that's like I said before, we'll take all that we can get. However, I do want to point out wherever we do happen to get a hit of slightly heavier rain, a little moderate shower, then you could have up to two tenths of an inch. So you could double that number if you're lucky. So cross your fingers. Most of us a tenth of an inch or less. 51 degrees was our temperature this morning by the afternoon. 73 both below average, but look at the potential. 97 is the record set back in 1950. It just goes to show how hot it can get this time of year. Now, anything but hot in North Texas, we actually had a cold front draped across the state. So Dallas, Abilene, Lubbock briefly hit 60 today. That's as warm as they got. Even Amarillo, 51 for the high, but Carrizo Springs, Catula, 81 degrees for the high temperature today. Tomorrow morning, we start the day right near 50 degrees. So another morning with a little bit of a chill in the air, below average for this time of year. 48 in San Antonio by noon, we clear out, we're at 62, and then 72 the high. And notice how we have that 20% chance of a rogue storm tomorrow afternoon. A small window of opportunity for about three hours tomorrow afternoon, early evening. We can't rule out one or two pop-ups non severe storms, but it's unlikely we'll see much if anything develop a 10 to 20% chance temperature wise mid 70s locally closer to 80 along the Rio Grande. That's where the sky will clear out more quickly and a lot more hours of sunshine. Elmendorf 72 tomorrow 74 Lackland and Von Army along with Hondo and we're back into the 80s by this upcoming weekend. So we will be warming up and the humidity is going to rise right now. Dew points right around 40 degrees. But by Saturday, you feel the stickiness and mugginess back in the air. And I do think that's going to lead to some morning fog and mist on Easter Sunday. So a little bit of that kind of misty dampness, but not real rain on Sunday morning. And by the way, this weekend will be into the 80s. Here's a live look outside of the live, live cam. If you're out earlier, you'd see some clouds starting to move in. They'll slowly fill in. And again, have that uh, umbrella within reach in the morning. Thank you. All right. Last night, a big shot, and there was a guy who traveled a long ways to see it. Later. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So they cut away once, and there was a uh, young girl and an, an older man. I don't know who that was to her, but they had a sign saying, we came in from Poland to watch Jeremy Sohan. I mean, how cool is that? Look at that. I flew 6,340 miles and Sohan put on a show for them. Plus, the NFL is changing kickoffs. We got the details coming up. I might have to. She's, uh, you know, good luck. Yeah, I might have to. Jeremy Sohan is talking about this girl, says he might have to invite her back after his huge performance with her in the house last night in big board sports. All right, so last night the Spurs picked a great time to play one of their better games of the season. No Wimby, no problem, as four guys stepped it up big time. Devin Vassell had 26 points. Zach Collins, starting for Wimby, had 18. Keldon Johnson scored 14 points off the bench. But the big dog was Jeremy Sohan, who finished with 26 points, a career-high 18 rebounds, one block, one steal, one assist, 10 for 19 from the floor, 5 for 5 from the free throw line, no turnovers, and the game-winning three-pointer with less than 30 seconds to go in regular. Spurs won a close one, 104 to 102. And how about that girl who had the sign saying she flew 6,340 miles from Poland to see Sohan? He was asked if he was aware of her. Um, I saw a sign, but I couldn't read it. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying to focus on the game and, you know, everything like that. So I wasn't really, you know, looking. But I saw something like that, and someone told me. Um, so they gave him uh, my shooting shirt. So, uh, you know, I feel like that, you know, makes my day. Uh, it means a lot. So, uh, you know, I just appreciate having fans all over the world and uh, from my home country, too, to, to support me. 
And the Phoenix Suns are currently eighth in the Western Conference, which would land them in the play-in tournament if the season ended today. And they're also one half game out of sixth place, which means they could avoid the play-in altogether. Phoenix guard Bradley Beal said they laid an egg and they thought it was going to be easy without Wimby, and they were wrong. It's unacceptable to lose that game. You know, for our guys, you know, we all said the right things. We all uh, did the right preparation to come in, but we didn't play with the necessary focus and disposition uh, throughout, uh, the, I would say, the first half. And you give a team like that life, and that's how the NBA works. They get they get going, they get charged up, they start believing they can they have a chance to win it. And um, credit those guys. They, you know, with Victor out, those guys played really well. All right, so Wimby sat out last night because of a sprained left ankle that he suffered in the Spurs' home loss to the Suns on Saturday night. Wimby tested it out yesterday morning before the game, and then the Spurs rolled him out. So here's Pop pregame last night addressing Wimby's left ankle. Well, I don't know if it's lingering. I mean, he just tweaked it sometime during the game, kept playing, and you know, bothered him afterward. Do you expect him to be back on Wednesday with your game? Uh, I, I think it's probably a little better than 50-50 chance. So the Spurs will next play at the Utah Jazz tomorrow night at 8. NFL owners approved a new kickoff, which will be similar to the format that originated in the XFL. During the 2024 NFL season, kickers will continue to kick from the 35-yard line, but the other 10 players on the kickoff team will line up at the receiving team's 40-yard line. At least nine members of the return team will line up in a setup zone between the 35 and 30-yard lines. Up to two returners can line up in a landing zone between the goal line and the 20-yard line. No one other than the kicker and returners can move until the ball hits the ground or hits a player inside the landing zone. Now, the NFL wants to make kickoffs exciting again, but keeping player safety in mind. Dallas Cowboys special teams coordinator John Fossil approves. Biggest benefit we're going to get from this, because this isn't just NFL, this is hopefully going for a long time, is the college potentially of adopting it, high school adopting it, flag football adopting it, like Riz said. I think that would probably make us the most proud of seeing this go to the other parts of football where today I feel like we made football better and I feel like we made football safer and that's going to trickle down to a whole bunch of other levels. UTSA backer Donye Taylor is money after the break. UTSA football kicked off week three of spring practice today at the race practice field. And one guy to watch this coming season is fifth year senior Donye Taylor. Last season, the money linebacker had 46 total tackles and two sacks. The former star player out of Shiner High School is a guy coach trailer can trust. You know, when he came out of Shiner, he was uh, uh, just kind of a knucklehead, to be honest with you. And he'd made the turn and now he's a single digit guy. Now he's a guy like I lean on him to lead. He knows what I want, and I know he can give it to me. Every day we're just getting better. It's just stacking days, uh, correcting the stuff that I messed up on the day before. I mean, it's, it's, you're never going to have a perfect day, but you can always strive to be perfect. Donye is the younger brother of former UTSA player, Daydrian Taylor. What did he say? He's a knucklehead? He was a he knucklehead. Was kind of a knucklehead. Was. Yeah, when a he came out of Shiner. Yeah, was. Yeah. <laughs> I think Trailer's channeling my dad there. <laughs> That's what I think has happened. Right. Yeah, that is an old school term. It right? is old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll be right back. <laughs>